the undeserved love, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you today and always. The word of God that we're going to meditate on today are the words that I mentioned from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. And I'd just like to reread the first verse. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. This is the word of our God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you gave a revelation to your apostle John that is outstanding and also sometimes confusing. <clears throat> By your Holy Spirit today, guide us into the truths of these words that we may understand what they are saying to us and be strengthened in our faith as we prepare to celebrate your birth. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, do you have a creche? Do you have a manger scene up in your house someplace? If you do, do you have a little baby Jesus in it? A little manger there? Do you have a Mary sitting next to the baby Jesus, smiling at him nicely? Do you have a Joseph standing there watching over them nicely in that manger? And maybe a few sheep and cows and maybe even a donkey in your manger? Well, how about this for a manger? A woman, a pregnant lady, screaming as she's about to give birth. A fiery red dragon with seven heads. A baby snatched out of the picture to God in heaven. A woman fleeing into the desert. That's the picture that John in Revelation gives to us today of what happened at Christmas. He says, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. And then he says a little bit later, another sign appeared in heaven. And as frightening as these pictures and these signs may be, they are the true picture of what happened at Christmas. You and I, as we celebrate Christmas, don't want to talk about such images, right? We like the, the tinsel and the, the eggnog and the, the bells and the, the glitter and make it nice and pretty. But that's not what we see. We see in heaven a sign that is somewhat frightful. And even though it's frightful, this wondrous sign tells the story of wondrous love. But in order to understand it, we have to unpack the sign a little bit, don't we? We have to understand what's going on and who this is. Because this is a special kind of literature in the Bible. This is called apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic literature has to be read in a special way. Here's a picture. I don't know if some of you recognize this or not, but this is a picture by the French artist Claude Monet. Claude Monet painted this. This is one of his favorite pictures, one of his most famous pictures. And it's called Impression Sunrise. And it's painted in what's called the Impressionistic art style. And what was characteristic of Impressionistic art was that you can't see a lot of detail, can you? It kind of, kind of is just figures and things in the picture. And that's because the idea behind Impressionistic art was that you get an impression. You don't get lost in all the detail of the picture. And that's kind of what apocalyptic literature in the Bible is like. Apocalyptic literature in the Bible is given to us to get an impression, to get an idea of something, to get some thoughts, not to get lost in too many of the details, even though we have to look at some of those details to get the overall impression. And when John says, a sign appeared in heaven, He's telling us that this is apocalyptic literature. This is a vision. And things in a vision are symbolic. And so we have to get underneath the symbols and find out what is this really telling us. And in order to do that, we have to go to other parts of Scripture. That's how we read apocalyptic literature. Because it's usually images of things that the Bible teaches elsewhere, only now it's being given us in a dramatic way. 
And we also look at the context because very often John in Revelation will tell us what some of those images represent and what they stand for so that we can understand the picture. So let's start. We have this picture, a great and wondrous sign, and that great and wondrous sign is a woman who's pregnant and about to give birth to a baby. Many people think that that's Mary, the Virgin Mary. But if we look carefully, it can't be the Virgin Mary in and of herself. Because Mary was a humble virgin, but this woman who is about to give birth is clothed in the sun. And she's standing on the moon. And she's got a crown on that has 12 stars. And it's a crown of victory. And then we're told that she flees into the desert for three and a half years. That's what 1260 days comes out to be. It's 42 months or three and a half years. Now there we have to begin to understand some of the symbolic numbers in the book of Revelation. Because the number for God is seven. It's a number of God's dealing with people because it's three, which is God's number, plus four, which is the number for people because you have four corners of the world. And those make seven, which means it's God's dealing with people on this earth. So the time of God's dealing, three and a half is half of seven, isn't it? And so half of God's time of dealing with God's people on earth would be the New Testament era from when this woman is about to give birth. And then we have those 12 stars in her crown. 12 is another symbolic number in the Bible because we had 12 tribes of Israel. We have 12 apostles who are the foundation of the church. So this woman is not Mary herself. It's the, the church, the bride of Christ, so to speak who is giving birth, bringing into the world Jesus, just as God said Jesus would come into this world. And she is crowned in the sun because that's the glory that Jesus has and that he is bringing to her through his work that is about to be shown in this vision. And that leads us, of course, to the baby that's born. She gives birth to a male child. It doesn't take much for us to figure out who that is, does it? That, of course, is Jesus being brought into this world. Jesus, a male child, coming into the, the world. And the birth pains that are there before she gives birth would be the longing of the church for Jesus to come. As we heard a couple of weeks ago in Malachi when we heard that the, the church was seeking and desiring the messenger of the covenant. And so in the Old Testament, we find again and again how the church is longing for Jesus to come into the world, longing for the Messiah to come until finally he's born. And that would be the other of those three and a half years, God's dealings with people prior to the birth of the Savior in this world. Then comes the birth of the Savior, and we're told that he is a child who comes into this world. Just as Isaiah said, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And that is a fulfillment of what God had told the whole church when he said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of, of Eden that he was going to send a child into this world, one who would be born of a woman who would then crush the serpent's head, who would be the deliverer for God's people. And this child, we're, set, we're told in this lesson, in this vision, is a child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. In fact, if we search scripture, that's an almost direct quote from Psalm, chapter, Psalm 2, verse 8, where it tells us that in prophecy, the Messiah would rule his enemies with a rod of iron. So these things are clear. The woman is the church giving birth now to Jesus in the time, the fullness of time that God had said. But here comes a character we haven't seen before. Suddenly there appears on the scene another sign and he is a great, enormous dragon. A dragon like we've never even imagined. A dragon with seven heads, frightening in his appearance. Now why seven heads? Well, seven, we said a moment ago, is the number of what? Of God's dealings with people. Now, why would this dragon be 
shown us with seven heads a number of God because the scripture tells us what does Satan like to do? Satan likes to masquerade as an angel of light. He likes to pretend that he is God. And in the, the words that follow our text, we have no doubt that this is Satan. For John tells us that this dragon is none other than that ancient serpent, Satan himself. He has seven heads and he has ten horns on those seven heads. Horns in the scripture, very frequently, a sign of power comes from a ram's horn or a goat's horn with which they, they butt and they fight and they protect themselves, right? So it's a sign of great power. This dragon has great power. But ten is also a sign of completeness or a limitation. So while he has power, his power is limited. He doesn't have power over God. And then we have seven crowns on those seven heads. Only these are not the same kind of crown that that woman had. The word used there is for a crown of victory. The word that's used here is the root of our word diadem. And a diadem is a fancy crown that's put on by somebody who presumes to have royalty or presumes to have authority. And again, Satan presumes that he is a ruler. He pretends that he is the one who has authority. So here's this great monstrous dragon and what's he doing? He's standing by that lady, that woman who's pregnant and he's waiting for her child to be born so that he can devour the child. You see, Satan knows that Jesus is coming into the world and he knows what Jesus' purpose is and he's going to do everything he can to try to stop Jesus from carrying out his mission, which was to destroy the devil, to destroy this dragon's power. Just think about that for a second. Think about the satanic act of Herod after Jesus was born in putting all of those little babies and children to death. Think about how when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went out into the wilderness and who came after him? Satan did. While he was starving in the wilderness, Satan tried to get him to fail in his mission, to worship Satan instead of carrying out his mission of delivering people through his death. Think about that close disciple whom Satan entered into in order to get him to betray his Savior to death. Think about those religious leaders of Jesus' day whom Satan deceived and blinded so that they would not believe in Jesus and eventually brought Jesus to be put to death on the cross. Think about that leader and close disciple of Jesus who one time tried to dissuade Jesus from going to the cross and carrying out his mission and Jesus had to turn to him and say, Get behind me, Satan! Think about the battle that went on in the Garden of Gethsemane as our Savior wrestled to go to the cross as God had determined to the point where his sweat was like drops of blood. The battle was so fierce until finally he went to the cross. Satan was trying to devour that child, trying to destroy him, but he didn't succeed. The child did what he came to do and when he was done, he was snatched up into heaven. The ascension of Jesus. And we're told not only to God, but he was ascended to the throne of God. To that rule, his exaltation in heaven. So the pictures are clear for us. And we begin to see there's so much more behind that manger than just a cute little baby in a, in a manger stall, right? But aren't we guilty sometimes, dear friends, of sentimentalizing Christmas? We like Christmas to make us feel warm and happy through the traditions and having our family all home. We like Christmas to be a happy time that we're focused on all of the traditions and the externals. But have we really grappled with what really Christmas is all about? 
In Revelation, John is here really giving us a picture of what Christmas is all about in living color. He's really explaining for us in graphic detail what it means when Scripture says God loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only Son. Stop and think about what that means in connection with this vision that we've just learned about. I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you. Those of you who are parents will understand what I'm about to tell you. When we lived in Minnesota, we once attended the Renaissance Fair up near the Twin Cities. Sprawling, big area, acres of land, tons of people, and we were there to, to uh, be part of a family wedding. And while we were at that wedding, and my oldest daughter, who's here today with us, was three years old. And we were talking with one another, and suddenly we looked, and she was gone. We looked around. We couldn't find her anywhere. And those of you who are parents know that feeling, if you've ever had that happen. Your heart absolutely stops. It's an absolutely frightening and horrifying feeling as a parent to realize that, that you've lost your child and that you as a parent have failed in your responsibility to protect and take care of that child. Of course, we found her. She's here today. <laughs> <laughs> but stop and think about God the Father for a second, who didn't fail his son and lose him, but willingly gave him into something that was as dreadful as this scene that we see in heaven today. For God the Father willingly sent his son where he knew that that dragon was just licking his chops to get a hold of him. He knew that as he came into this world as a true man to take our place, he would suffer the onslaught of Satan in this world and the torment and the torture of having close friends turn against him and abandon him. And the pain and suffering of going to the cross and the torture of the Roman soldiers. But the worst of his suffering was actually not at the hand of the dragon directly, but at the hand of God's justice as he took our sin upon himself and felt the sting of God's wrath on that cross because of us. And yet, the Father did that willingly sent his son into this world with that dragon waiting. Why would he do that? Because he loved us. Because he had grace in his heart for us. Undeserved, unmerited, unconditional love for us. And because of that unconditional love, that son that he sent defeated that dragon. Sometimes, dear friends, we don't understand or we forget how much God really loves us. Sometimes we kind of look for God's love for us in the wrong places. For example, we think that God loves us if he keeps our bank account pretty good. Or we feel like God loves us if he doesn't let us get sick, keeps our health good. Or we look for proof in God's love in the fact that we aren't having any troubles or any difficulties in this world. But dear friends, those are all the wrong places to look. Scripture tells us where to look for proof of God's love for us. There's only one place to look. God loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son. If we want proof of God's love, don't look at what's happening in your life. Look at the cross. There is the ultimate proof of God's love. And this wondrous sign shows us that wondrous love. And his love even goes beyond that, dear friends, because not only did he send his son into this world to defeat Satan for us, but you'll notice at the end of this vision, that woman flees to the desert to a place that God prepared for her. You see, later on we find out that she's fleeing from the devil, from that dragon who's decided he can't get the son, so he's going to chase those who are believers, the woman, the church. Only God protects her. He 
provides a place for her. And yes, it's a desert. <laughs> it's not home yet. It's a place where we have to journey through. And like deserts, it's sometimes difficult. And like deserts, it's sometimes not pleasant. And like deserts, you have trials and troubles and tribulations while we're here going through that desert. But the fact is that we've, we're protected in that desert. Satan's power has been destroyed. He cannot have us. He can't seek any one of those seven heads of teeth into us ever because Jesus has destroyed his power over us. And, and so God there, we're told, nourishes that woman. And what does he nourish her with? He nourishes her with his promise of love. He nourishes her with the gospel message, the living water, the living bread that sustains us on this journey through life. That's how much God loves us as his church and as he loved his son. A wondrous sign that shows us some wondrous love. As you get ready for the next two days of celebrating the birth of our Savior, remember this sign that we've learned about today. It may be a frightening sign, but it's sharing with us some of the most amazing love of God's grace to us. And it's far different of a sign than that manger that looks so clean and neat that's on our shelves. Because this wondrous sign of God's love passes before us the cosmic battle that God did for our souls. God gave his son into the dragon's lair to defeat that dragon for us. What wondrous love is this. Amen.